Good evening. Good evening from Edinburgh and uh, welcome to the June Outturn with you. Uh, so my name is Olaf. I'm going to be your host this evening. And uh, I've been a member of the Society since 1992 and uh, also part of the panel uh, for the last 20 years. I'm one of the chairpersons of the panel, so therefore some of those tasty notes you are so familiar with, uh, I probably have uh, written. Uh, so I love the society. I love the society to bits. Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. The crew is in the name. What we're doing is Scotch Malt Whiskey. But what I'm doing here this evening, uh, that's why I really love it even more if that's possible. Because what I'm going to showcase this evening from the outturn which we have in June is the Grain G420 or Grain Whiskey. Then we're going to have a new distillery of gin. That's GN 4.1. And I'm going to showcase that with the actual distillery bottling as well from the gin. So uh, I'm looking forward to that one. And finally, we've got a rum R2.11. Now, let's get right into it. You're probably going to say, or maybe think, uh, I don't know, uh, all this new stuff that's going on with the Scotch Moor Brisky Society. A grain, a gin, a rum. Well, let me show you this one here. Look at the good old, uh, good old box, box from the society. Know if uh, the paintings on it. And I'll take that out. That was our first grain which we have thought of. In those days, we just called it G1. We didn't put a cast number on it because we never thought we were going to bottle a lot of grain. And uh, at the time when we bottled this, uh, just like when we started the society in 1983, everyone was saying, who's going to drink single malt Scotch whiskey? Well, when we bottled this one, which was in 2006, so that's uh, 14 years ago now, everyone said as well, what a single cask grain? What is that? And no one's going to drink it. Well, I think we've proven them wrong uh, in 1983, but also in uh, 2006. That was the first one, G1. No idea that we have that we're now at G14. We bought 14 grain distilleries. Uh, we bought what uh, whiskey from. Grain is different from to, to all, uh, obviously, grain whiskey. And very often when I'll do tastings and someone's going to come and sort of say, the glass. Mm, this doesn't smell like more whiskey. I always say Einstein because it's not a malt whiskey. It's different. You have to be open-minded. You at the Scotch for Whiskey Society, so you know uh, it, it, it's, it's always different because every cask is different and every distillery could be the same day distilled. It might be different. And that's the beauty about it. So just have an open mind, fresh eyes, and try it. And I can tell you this one is marvelous. So I'll give you a little bit of a hint. It's G4, that's the bottle here. G420, milk and honey, it is called. Uh, it's the oldest grain distillery in Scotland. It was founded in 1824. And in 1877, it was one of the founding members of PCL Distillers Company Limited, which is now Diageo. So it's the largest grain distillery in Scotland as well. And uh, the 20th cask, we've got it from that. I'm trying to cast from the, from the distillery. It's a refill hoggy, 49.7% and 40 years old. 40 years old history in a glass. It's a, so with 49% as well, 49.7, pretty sure it hasn't gone in at 63% like most usually go into the cask uh, because otherwise you would have had a lot lower alcohol by the end of 40 years. Uh, the angels seem to have liked this one a lot uh, because it's only 82 bottles, uh, one out of 82 bottles. And uh, I don't blame the angels because this is wonderful. So I have a bottle. If you were lucky enough to get a bottle, I can only recommend you. Don't let it cover in dust. Open it. Open the bottle, pour it, and share it with your friends. Uh, maybe just your best friend. We can say anyone else. Maybe, maybe just with your best friend. I mean, don't don't share with with, uh, with everyone because it is uh, stunning. Distilled 
on the 28th of May 1979, and the price was, because it is sold out, that was £195. A lot of money, yes, I do know, but it's worth every penny of that, I would say. And uh, try and find a 40-year-old single malt whiskey these days, which actually at that price, but also at that quality which we're having here. These are moments uh, which are so rare. I could know that all night. But that wonderful nose, it's a history in a glass. Uh, if you're unlucky enough to have been born uh, already uh, in 1979, for me actually, that was the first year I came to England for language lessons. Uh, so uh, I was just packing my bags, so to speak, for well, coming in July. I went to Devon, uh, nice family, family Tucker. And uh, I lived there in Sidmouth, or just outside Sidmouth, in a wonderful little village called Newton Copperfield. That's where I was my first time in the, in the UK. So here we are having a glass. Someone has been distilled that 50 years ago, and we've got it in our glass here. I mean, I've been 20 years in the panel. There are very few times when the panel falls silence, because we always have something to say, as you know on the tasting notes. This was one of those moments. Everyone just, just was engrossed with that dram, enjoying it. So I was the chairperson of that panel, and uh, I had to get everyone sort of wakey-wakey, we'll, we'll need some notes. But actually, we didn't get many notes. So uh, what I did, I just fell back to music, because music and aroma have such a wonderful way of putting you back in time or to different places as well. And uh, so this is how this note came about, this tasting note. So if you want to look at it, Amy Stewart uh, sang for the first time in 1979, Knock on Wood. And I'm thinking this one has been knocked on wood quite often. Maybe also the distillery uh, workers had to make sure the quality control uh, always because uh, that's why it's probably only two rockets uh, of that one. So that was Amy Stewart. I know uh, Eddie Floyd sang it first in 1966, and then David Bowie did it in 1974. But as I say, Amy Stewart made a bit of song, not so good. Uh, Blondie was singing Half of Class, which uh, fits very well. It's a very fragile, a very romantic whiskey in a way. And uh, just like that drum, it's, it's heaven. And that's what the Bee Gees sang in 1979, because they sang, nobody gets too much heaven no more. And uh, how true that is at the moment. And from their 13th album, that song was, and their 13th album was called Spirits Having Flown. How up fast here as well. So let the spirits flow, because I'm going to have a sip now. This is nectar. This is nectar for God. Not dominated by the wood. 40 years, you always think, mm, maybe maybe a bit too long. But being a, a refill hoggy as well, a boring refill hog set, uh, wonderful. Just, just right, just right. It's sweet, it's smooth. There's a lovely velvety note to it as well. But there's also, which is fascinating, still a bit of life in it. I mean, sort of, it's it's not dead. It's not been long. No, there is still the spirit as well. You, you, can, you can sense it. You can feel it. And uh, Donna Summer was singing hot stuff in 1979. So this is certainly hot stuff we're having here. So, yes, you can use some water if you wish. There is my water jug. And people who know me. I hate this pipette, but I think here it's necessary because you, you shouldn't be drowning that whiskey. With 40 years in a cask, you can destroy it within two seconds when you just put too much water in. So I'll put some water in. As I say, not much. Just a teardrop. And all I can say, that's why it's called milk and honey, because it is like milk and honey, but it's the Eurovision Song Contest. Hello, Jens. It's, uh, it's the Eurovision Song Contest, uh, winner of the year 1979, 
that was Galiatari with the group Milk and Honey, and they sang the song Hallelujah. And I can only tell you, I'm singing Hallelujah. And so I think the angels as well which took quite a bit of that uh, of that cask. And the first few lines of that song, because they're singing in Hebrew, but the first of the song is that the world everyone will sing with one single word. The heart is filled with so much gratitude, and it also parents with a wonderful world. Hallelujah. Yeah, I I could just I could have that all night. I could just go now and but I've still got a job to do, so I'll I'll stick around with you. If you don't know who the what the distillery is, the G4, obviously we never tell you. Uh, you can obviously look it up, but don't look it up. Uh, I'll tell you. In 2014, it became a bit got some famous. Uh, it got famous because it is the Hague Club whiskey, single grain whiskey from a certain footballer, which is advertising it. Uh, at the Hague Club, if you still don't know, I'll give you another hint, uh, but then you must have it. Because actually, already many, many years before that came out, there was, there is, a, there is actually a nine year old grain whiskey from that distillery. You can still purchase it, around 30 pounds a bottle. Uh, single grain whiskey and has the name the name is Cameron Drake. That's the that's the uh, that's the, uh, the brand. So I think we've got it we've got it now. And uh, yeah I don't mind if people are snobby. Thanks Brad. Uh, no I'm I'm I don't mind people being snobby and saying oh I don't drink that you know it's grain whiskey it's just milk whiskey to be neutral blended whiskey or something. Just between you and me, just keep them like that because then there's more left for us. And uh, Oscar Wilde uh, once said, and cynic knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And uh, here, as I say, 195 pounds, uh, yeah, every, every penny. It's enjoyment for the whole, the whole bottle here. Right, I'll have to move on. I'll have to move on. I don't really want to move on, but I'll have to move on. Uh, uh, also, actually, that distillery, that distillery uh, does water spirit for Smirnoff Vodka, for Tankery Gin, and for Gordon's Gin. Uh, so it's a large distillery. It's a large alcohol factory, really. And uh, I don't know if it's true, uh, but I've read somewhere many years ago that 70% of all spirit made for gin in the United Kingdom is made in Scotland for the spirit and then it gets transported to, to London or to Plymouth or wherever with the botanicals. So uh, yeah, ah, it's a good number so I'll just I'll throw it in. So say, don't, don't quote me on it. Uh, gin in the middle, uh, yeah, because I wanted to give milk and honey the G4 uh, 20 really all the all the uh, all the attention, all the spotlight. And now we're moving on to cast number GN 4.1. And uh, I was sort of thinking the gin in the middle as well, because in the olden days, you know, I'm, I'm gray and uh, so I, I lived in 79. I went to summer school. Um, in the olden days, when you flew from Europe or from the UK to, to, Amer to America, North America, South America, you had to stop over in Shannon Island, in Ireland uh, to refuel with the plane and then keep going. So I thought we're going to make a fueling stop in Ireland, to be precise, in Northern Ireland at uh, this time, and because then we're flying on to Guyana in South America with the uh, rum. So that's what we're doing. So GN 4.1, so that's the first cask we have brought it from the fourth gin distillery, and uh, it's a uh, first co barrel. It was in there for nine months uh, in, in that cask, the gin, and it's 48.4% alcohol, and it's got 49 pounds. And when I last looked, uh, this afternoon around five o'clock, there were still 28 bottles left on the website of that, of that gin. Now, after, after one, we have got it. And I'll tell you what it is because, as I say, I've got the, uh, I've got the original bottling as well, which is the boat yard in Northern Ireland. And uh, the beauty about this one is it's boat yard from Northern Ireland and it's still McGear who uh, actually opened the distillery. And he's a very good friend. We go back many, many years because he used to work at the Scottish Whiskey Society. He used to be in Queen Street. 
and then he moved to Queen Street in London for uh, a long time uh, before he went back to Northern Ireland, back to his family home, and uh, opened the distillery. So, uh, actually, if you want to see Joe, uh, I looked it up in the silver screen. You can see a very young Joe uh, in May 2012. He's done uh, two in the podcast. He's done two whiskey trials in London, in the London office in 2012. If you want to see uh, the big age in the year when we went to the distillery, that was on the 5th of June in the first Friday pub session. Uh, he's actually in there standing proudly in front of his, of his gin still, making whiskey as well. But that takes three years before it becomes whiskey. And gin as well, and he's talking about that. Uh, so, yeah. I I loved uh, <laughs> friend Joe. I, I didn't know if I should say it, but uh, actually, Joe, I, I don't know really why I trust him, because he loves Buckfast. And uh, I've never had Buckfast in my life, and, and it's leaving you from Scotland to London, because he knew I didn't know Buckfast, he brought in a bottle of Buckfast. And that was my first time I drank Buckfast, and I can rest assure you, it was the last time I went back fast. So, yeah. So, but, uh, Joe, no, you're doing a fantastic job here with those, uh, with, uh, with those tins. Because what we're having here is a very typical London dry gin. It's, uh, juniper based. Uh, it's 86%. It tells you all at the back here, uh, so all the ingredients, uh, telling you, uh, I can't even read that with glasses. So I've written it down here. So you've got botanicals. Uh, uh, angelica, licorice root, lemon oris, grains of paradise, and coriander. And also you've got sweet gale, rock myrtle, which uh, is actually picked from the farm of his parents. So there's a nice local twist to it as well. Uh, so here we are. That's, uh, that's the, the clear liquor from the distillery. Ah, yes. You know me, 35, always a, always a favorite of mine. Uh, so, very clear, clear liquor here, because obviously it's, it's not been in a cask. And the first thing you're getting is exactly that juniper hit. That's what gin is about. Juniper driven, uh, for me, uh, if I want a gin, I want a juniper driven with, with, other, with other things to balance it out. But the main thing is juniper, and that's what you're getting here as well with this, uh, what do they call it? Double gin, Ojiat double gin, because it's somehow like the Dutch do it with their Geneva. So don't ask me, I'm not a, I'm not a gin expert, uh, but it's, it's sort of a, a, it goes twice through the juniper, so therefore it picks up even more of the juniper flavors as you would expect. Also quite, quite good. Obviously, Joe being in the school at the Scottsdale Whiskey Society, because it's 46% alcohol in that bottle, 46, uh, which is, uh, yeah, which is very good because uh, gin can actually go down to 37.5% alcohol. Uh, so you could buy gin as low as that. Uh, obviously, we know in the society, you all know as members, uh, really, you don't want to dilute it uh, that far. I mean, if you want to do it, do it yourself, but not in the bottle as it is. It's got a fresh citrus note, maritime. You've got that sweetness, that, that sweet gale, that sort of, uh, certainly been there. I could drink that meat. But then I'm from Germany, so I can drink schnapps. Yeah, so. No, it's, it's nice, very, it's very pleasant, very balanced, as I say. The juniper, very pronounced, uh, but yeah, uh, that's me. Here is our. You can see the difference, but well, you probably can't in my light. Oh, if I can't get it in here. So there you see, it's got quite a nice color. And it's only nine months been in that cask compared to the, compared to the, uh, the, uh, the original gin. So, nine months, but it's the first fill barrel it took. Because all the other gins we had so far, they were all in second fill barrels. So here we've got a first fill American oak barrel, and that's why you're getting that wonderful color already, even after nine months, because it's a very, very active cask. And uh, when you're smelling it, a lot more herbal notes, uh, minty notes as well, I would say. 
Yeah, still the sweetness, of course. Wonderful. But it's just it's just amazing how different, how, not just the color, but how different the aroma is. But uh, that's the beauty of casks, of single casks as well. With, as, uh, as Aristotle once said, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And that is very true with, uh, with casks. By the way, the cask is much, much more important in, invention than the wheel because you can't mature whiskey, or in this case, gin, in a wheel, you need a cask. So, I'll drink to that. GN 4.1. Yep. If I say I can drink the first one neat, I can certainly drink that one neat. Lovely sort of herbal notes, uh, uh, sort of a, yeah, I mean, it's, I would say sort of sea, certainly the sea, the sea influence is there for me, sort of a, a maritime character, hail, maybe, I mean, sort of a little bit of saltiness as well, brininess, oiliness, uh, and a sugary edge to it. That sugary edge, which probably is the American oak cask, still that very active one with the heavy char inside the barrel. Uh, it's all about balance. And I would say these two are an absolute beauty. So Joe, well done. And keep going. And I'm looking forward to trying the whiskey when, if and when it's ready. Obviously, most gin not get drunk the way I'll drink it now. Uh, but Joe, uh, his his best recipe as far as he's concerned is uh, he said is ginger ale and a shaving of orange peel. So he recommends uh, two parts of ginger ale, one part of gin, uh, sort of an old fashioned style. And uh, I've done that here. That's how you can see the box is already sort of uh, fairly in tone. I've done that. Works really well with ginger ale. Obviously works well with soda as well. And uh, the, uh, the clear one is the tonic one, gin and tonic. And if you say, if you like London dry gin, this one, as well as our one here, uh, very, very well balanced. And uh, yeah, as I say, if you want to get your hand onto one of those, you will not be disappointed. Good. From Mother's Ruin, because that's what gin was called in the 18th century, uh, we're going now to the Kill Devil, uh, because that's what rum was called in the 17th century. 17th, uh, Richard Ligon uh, described it when he visited Barbados and he called it Kill Devil. And uh, rum, well, you're opening up a whole new world really with rum. Uh, you can have rum anywhere. Most people think about rum, they think about the Caribbean because that, that's obviously where rum, reggae, sand, sun, sea, you name it, calypso. That's where the rum comes, that's where the rum comes from in a way. Uh, but uh, Rum can come from many countries. Actually, Australia, India, Mexico are very big rum producers. There are around 80 countries in the world that are producing rum. And everyone produces rum their own, their way. So there is no rules and regulations. That's the problem you have with rum because it can be made anywhere with anything you want and add anything you want. But the rules, but the problem is you have to be, you have to know what you're buying. So that's why you go to the society. Because you know what you're getting, you're getting single cask from no sugar added, no color added, no non-diluted. Well, sometimes it's diluted now. I'll tell you why in a, in a minute. Uh, so I actually have to check again today. I've put one in my house here from 19 different countries. And no, I'm not going to tell you where I live, uh, but that's how different one can be. And it's fascinating. You can split it how you want. I mean, instead of that the obvious way is to say Spanish style, French style, and British style. That's the easiest way to do it. So basically, the countries where the Spaniards mainly were, where they speak Spanish, that's the sort of sweeter one to get. The French ones, uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe, uh, all these, they use fresh sugar cane juice rather than molasses. But either molasses, basically, it's the byproduct of making sugar, and that's molasses, or you take the sugar cane and make press it and you get the juice immediately. And that's what the French do, that's the rum agricole. Uh, and uh, then you've got the, the British one, which are sort of the navy style rums, uh, which obviously uh, was, the, was the biggest thing uh, to 
which of, of, uh, of Rome uh, for many, many centuries. So, uh, I've got a map of the Caribbean, which hang on, you might be able to see, up so that one here, and uh, well, up here where my finger is, that's basically where Florida is, and you go down to Cuba, you put Jamaica here, and then like a pearl, all of these islands come all the way down until you get down to uh, Trinidad, and then you come into uh, Venezuela and uh, Guyana. And Guyana is that place here. You can't see it at the top because this one is a map from El Dorado. El Dorado being the, the brand name from the Guyana. From Guyana. I'll take you back from Friday. Oh, still got it, right? Okay, off you go. Uh, so it's it's Guyana. Now, it's Caribbean. Now, you're going to say, hang on, Guyana is in South America. How can it be Caribbean? That's all the islands uh, along there. Yes, it is. But in a way, I'm, I'm a big cricket fan as well. Uh, so there you have it, uh, a German talking about whiskey and rum and liking cricket. Well, always expect the unexpected. Uh, so that's why uh, it's still, it is part of the West Indies cricket team. Uh, they're just now in England, uh, going to play three tests in uh, July. I'm looking forward uh, to that. Well, it, it's, you can't reach it for two months a year, of course. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's going to happen in, in, in July. And uh, Rihanna is part of the West Indies cricket team. Um, but you can see if I go uh, that way, that's, the, that's an old uh, West Indies cricket shirt. And uh, these guys, uh, famous names uh, from Guyana, Ty Floyd, Carl Hooper, Sugar Ryan, Thunder Paul. From the rest of one, just to mention a few real, real stars in the in the cricket in the cricket scene. So Guyana, probably everyone heard of Demerara sugar. Well, if you have Demerara sugar, because that's what it is, it's sugar, then you get Demerara rum, and that's exactly what that is, Demerara rum. And it's called Demerara because the river Demerara was going through the country of Guyana, and all the sugar plantations were at the water at the river, because that's how they can transport things in and out. Of the, of the jungles of the, of the area. So that was the main route. And that's why everything is called the Marara. It's just like space light in a way. The space light is the river spray going through. It wasn't the river which made it that all the distilleries started there. It was the trains that were coming after. And the trains were then the ones that the train lines are exactly along the, 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 the river, the river spray. And uh, if you want to, there's a wonderful long distance walk as well. You can do it from Abbeymore. All the way to Spay Bay, uh, basically walking along the old rail railway line. So, Demerara, uh, there were lots and lots. I mean, we're talking 50, 60, 70 uh, sugar mills as well as distilleries, because you always had a distillery next to the sugar mill. Concentration as it was in the 1950s, it then went down to five and then eventually down to one. But what they did, which was very unique, they took all the different stills from the different distilleries and put them all into that distillery, which is called the Diamond Distillery. Uh, never been there. And uh, they have a wooden still, they have a wooden pot still, a wooden continuous still. They've got all sorts of weird things and I've seen lots of photos, but I've never been there. I really would be looking forward to, to go there. And basically what they're doing is they're still making lots and lots of salt rum for your normal uh, rum that you, you can buy, you know, going to pop or something, your rum and so and all that. Uh, but they're also having the El Dorado brand. That's the key brand which they're having, all sorts of different ages as well, and certainly worth trying. Now, now you're probably going to think, hang on, hold on, what are you talking about? I mean, grain whiskey, okay, that's fine. Gin, I think that's okay. But rum, I mean, are you, I mean, that's a society just growing everywhere. No, we don't. But uh, dare I say, I've got another little box, even older, even older. Oh, I'm out of it. And what comes out? The Marara single cast from it. It was the first one which we ever had was in 2001. That was when we had uh, three bottlings. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I'm probably part of the reason uh, why, because then the, uh, the managing director, this guy was Jamaican, and uh, we were talking about the rum, and I sort of said we really should be dropping single cast rum. And there we are, we've got the three casts. Cast number one was Jamaica, cast number two was Demerara, and cast number three was from Barbados. And before they just cast number, 
And that's the minute you go into R1, R2, and R3 in a way. Uh, but this one, as I say, 2001, so that's 20 years ago, 19 years ago, we thought would run. So it's not a new thing. Uh, we haven't done that much. That was always a break and stuff, and we haven't played that in runs and everything. And uh, R5 could never look back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that track up. Actually, you mentioned R5.2 because uh, uh, if you are interested in rum, it's quite difficult. There are a few books now you can you can have and read and everything. A lot of them are always just cocktail books as well and stuff. Uh, but uh, there is one website which I really would uh, recommend to you if you are interested in rum. That's called the Lone Painter. Lone Painter. Fantastic website. He's been doing it for, I don't know, a long time. And uh, he was talking about the Scotchmore Whiskey Society the other, uh, the other day and said, the first rums, I can't find any trace of were released as far back as 2001. And the strange thing is that nobody at the Scotchmore Whiskey Society seems to be able to recall anything about them other than they existed. And all he has left, he said, is photos and anecdotes. That's all he has. Mm -hmm. Well, Lone Painter, there is one here. I also got the uh, first one from Barbados. I never got the first one from Jamaica. So uh, if anyone's got a cast mm -hmm. number one from 2001 mm -hmm. Jamaica, I'm your man. So, but he also, if you want to read the tasting note from, from the Lone Painter, you should be reading the R5.1. 5.1, you just mentioned 5.2, so that's a Jamaican one. And this one came in and we bottled it at cask strength in those days as well, because we said it's cask strength, we're not diluting it. But that came in at a whopping 81.3% alcohol, 81.3. We wouldn't do this today, we would dilute it down uh, to a, a more sort of drinking level. But that's the problem with single cask rums as well. They are very, very different, and you should treat them very, very different. Than whiskey because it's a different it's a different drink. So, so here we are, Guyanese rum. That's what it looks like today. Obviously, a lot more lot more information as well because uh, compared to compared to that one. But in a way, just a, a logic a logical move. Now, this one is R two eleven. It's uh, sixteen years old. 59.1%, so that's in rum terms, almost mother's milk, really. 1st of May, 2003 distilled, and it was for 15 years in a bourbon barrel, as most rum would be, uh, just like the bourbon barrels we use in Scotland, they would use the bourbon barrels as well. Most of them would be using it, uh, except for the French islands, they use mainly cognac and armagnac barrels, and of course, Cuba uh, is not using any American bourbon barrels, for the time being at least. And uh, that was 15 years, and then it was one year in a first fill X wine barrique. So we have additionally matured it for a year in a wine barrique cask, which is very unusual, but uh, always expect the unexpected with us in the society. And uh, I, again, when I looked at uh, five o'clock, there were 15 bottles left of that one. Price is £79.50. And uh, again, if I wouldn't have it, I would be buying it. So it is a very different thing. I mean, again, all this information and everything, at the end of the day, the information is good. But you try it, you see if you like it. If you like it, it's a good whiskey, a good gin, a good rum, a good cognac, a good armagnac. If you don't like it, it's a bad one. And it could be a bad one. It doesn't mean to your neighbor or for your colleague or something, or for your friend, everyone's different. But with rum, I'll give you a little bit of a, a price. As you can see, I've already got a different glass. And I've got the lid on top, so I'll just take it off now. And I've got a different glass. Why? Because the rum has so much aroma. You don't want to come all through like this, like in a, in a whiskey. When you, it just comes on its own. So therefore, I pick up a bigger glass, a little bit licking out at the top, that is the real glass here, I've got here, and I think I'm right in saying I've put it for a long time. I think it's called cognac. They recommend that one here. So we've got that. The lipping out as well helps when you drink it, so it just goes all over your tongue immediately rather than just on the front and then makes its way back. Which again, I just find much more pleasant with uh, with rum. 
uh, and actually, you know, put all these different glasses and see how it goes and, uh, and what to do. So lovely color as well. Obviously, that, that might be the, the, the year in the, in the red wine as well. I'm pretty sure it is. So they usually would be using re refill uh, in, uh, in the sort of, um, Now, it's not my tasting note, but I love it. Fruit farms, esters, and wine oak. Um, how, how would anyone write this and think you're going to sell the bottle? Well, you can, because it is an amazing, an amazing rum. Exhilarating nose of weighted ass. As I say, I didn't write it, so I can say how wonderful it is. Uh, bicycle inner tube, yep. Chutney, orange vitamin pills, you didn't know. Sticking plaster harvested from a swimming pool. Ancient medicine, cannabis, oh, wouldn't know, wouldn't know. And banana heavy esters, yeah, very, very typical, those high esters. Uh, we all know the PPM from Peaky Whiskies, you know how many parts per million are in the malted barley. Well, in rum, you have the PPM in ester, i.e. How, how high is the ester concentrate? Because these guys sometimes ferment for weeks, two, three weeks, and most of the time it's two days, four days. That's so long compared to Scotland's whiskey, which is about usually between 50 hours short, sort of, and 100 hours long. Uh, here, yes, as I say, we can talk up to two, three weeks of fermentation, so you get a lot of essence. And single cask rum is very rare. I mean, single cask whiskey is very rare, but this is even rarer because it is not your typical, what you would expect the rum to be. And, uh, I'll give it a, I'll, I'll give it a try. This is huge. Tears coming to my eyes here. This is, uh, yeah, what have we said here? A massive texture at first sipping. Comfort, sweet rubber, brown sugar laced with natural tar. Yeah, it's all there. Now, the problem with rum is that's not the way you should be drinking it. Well, you should try it like that, but then you shouldn't stop because rum takes well everything takes time whiskey drinking you shouldn't rush but rum takes even more time and there was a nice caribbean saying which says taking your time is not being lazy so just like a sort of a, a tv chef in a cooking program here is something i prepared earlier that's another glass here and uh, as you can see already i've added quite a bit of water to that one and i let it sit for the last 40 minutes now because i just poured it in and I let the air go to it. I didn't close it up. So it's been sitting there for 40 minutes with water, sort of water as well. So you can start, sort of, it can all happen at the end of it, breaking it up as well as the water. And as I say, I put a fair amount of water in there. You can see it on the, on the color. Because now after half an hour, it's a completely different drink. These two are just chalk and cheese. And that's the issue with rum, because you nose it, you drink it, you say, oh, this is hot, this is strong, this is, and you add some water to it, and you nose it, and you say it's even stronger, because it is even stronger, because when you're adding the water, that's when all the esters come out, that's when that will happen. So therefore, you have to give it time. You let it air, you let it sit there. Uh, so drink your whiskey, and then come to the rum. And uh, you got that here now, R27. Thank you, yeah. It's just, I mean, you, you wouldn't believe it's the same, it's the same rum. And as I say, it's, it's just half an hour, 40 minutes. Because now when you drink it, there's a lot more sweetness. It hasn't got that biting note. What did we say here? Let me see, what did they say? Rose jelly, lime, spouse with antiseptic, rhubarb sherbet. Uh, sea water, green olives, and uh, some charred goat meat. Yeah, I get, get, I get, I don't, maybe cheese, I would rather say, sort of a goat, goat cheese, sort of over, over, a, 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 yeah, charred. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. As I say, this one, 
it really was almost, almost painful, quite honest. This is the real thing. Mum always makes me smile I mean, because it's just that wonderful thing. You can hear the palm trees, you know, you can feel the sun as well, and it's, uh, it's great. Now, we called it as well mad yet beautifully entertaining. And that's what that is. It's mad, but it's worthwhile experimenting. Uh, honestly, I have to say to you, if this is your first uh, attempt at drinking rum, I would probably guide you to the Spanish type rum. Like we have the R8 from Nicaragua, the R9 from Panama, the R12 from Belize as well. But these are much more easier drinking ones. They are fantastic, but they're more what you would expect probably a rum to do. And then you can move on to the Jamaican, Guyana, Trinidad, uh, and Barbados sits somewhere in the middle here. We've had R3, which is uh, also quite a, uh, an extraordinary rum, and then R6 as well from Barbados, which is a lovely, a lovely rum as well. So as I say, start maybe with the Spanish ones, and then move your way uh, as you move, go, go along. It's just like with peachy whiskies. On the other hand, some people are probably going to say, I just like the peachy whiskies, and that's where I started, and you might start with that as well here. Uh, so hopefully when things are opening up again, you can try all these things, and uh, as I say, uh, I would, I, I just would do it. It's, a, it's an adventure, uh, but that's what we're here for in the Scotch Forest Society. Right, so I'll put that aside. I'm going to add some water later on for that one. I'm not going to drink that, but I'm going to drink that. But uh, of course, I have to mention Barbados. Uh, my name's in it, I think, so you can see here Mount Gay. Mount Gay Rum, that's a very, very big brand name in Barbados. It's uh, because it's seen as the birthplace of rum. I mean, who knows? Uh, nobody knows. But uh, it's, uh, it's the oldest rum distillery as well, Mount Gay. It can go back, documented history, tracing back to 1703. Uh, that's uh, really no no other distillery we know of which has been registered and which, which has that, that history going back that long. So here we are. Uh, and we come back to Mr. Ligon, uh, Richard Ligon. He was from Devon. So there we go. We're back in Devon. Now was in 1979 because he described the chill devil, as it was called then, that after a lot of that chill devil was consumed, there was a rumbullion, as we called it. And a rumbullion is a great tumult or a fight. And uh, apparently that's where he got the name rum from. Uh, never. Never let the truth get in, in, in the way of a, of a good story. I like that one because there's other reasons to think that it's, uh, it's, uh, saccharum, whatever, Latin for, for the, for the, uh, sugarcane. That's not so much fun. I prefer that one. And uh, I can tell you if you're drinking that half strength, there will be a lot going on. Ah, yes, cognac. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ah, look. hello, Peter. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Let's try some ammoniac as well. Try some ammoniac. So, uh, talking of a good story, uh, that, this one's real. Uh, Barack Obama, uh, for his second you know, inauguration party, asked Beyonce to sing for, for him. Well, George Washington, the first president of the United States, he stayed for four months in Barbados, 1752. And, uh, his inauguration party of being the first president of the United States in 1789, he only had one simple request, two barrels of Barbados rum for my guest. So I know which party I would have rather joined, uh, but it's up to you. That, that really brings me sort of to the, to the end of, of this evening. I hope I was able to widen the horizon a little bit. Uh, I had the grain from the Kingdom of Five, I had the gin from Northern Ireland, and I had the rum from Guyana. And uh, I'll just say, don't be shy. Just give it a try. Cheers. <laughs>